Well, thank you very, very much, and um, Ron, Mark, and Devaney, especially because um, it's great to return uh, for you know uh, the reasons I think I mentioned to you before. This was really the place where um, I was properly and unproperly introduced to the American romanticism, <laughs> the American versions of romanticism. So. Um, I'm glad to return and um, hopefully have pushed the uh, project a little further. Um, so again, thank you very, very much indeed. And thank you all very much for um, coming here on such a beautiful day. I hope it's worth. Um, so let me um, start straight away so that we have some time for questions later. My claims today primarily concern a particular temporality of literary history. A constellation, as Walter Benjamin might say. Put in very general terms, I challenge a master narrative of the transition from Enlightenment to Romanticism and its monolingual historical formation. As a result of this monolingual approach, I suggest our accounts of literary history have obscured important patterns that I think we need to recover if we want to understand the period in its historical and theoretical complexity. One such pattern that I would like to explore in this talk concerns a number of little known but critically important links between the English poet William Blake, the German thinker Georg Hamann, and against the backdrop of the nonconformist polyglot Moravian church at Fetter Lane in 18th century London. Let's start with what we might call the official line on Anglo-German relations, succinctly put by Leslie Stephen, who doesn't suggest much hope with the kind of project I'm engaged in. Stephen, it is a familiar fact that no Englishman read German literature in the 18th century. One sufficient reason was that there was no German literature to read." Unquote. This view, first created in the Romantic period itself, then solidified in Victorian scholarship, in, uh, is still pretty much at the basis of our standard accounts of literary Anglo-German history. The narrative posits as the ur-moment of this reception Henry Mackenzie's enthusiastic 1788 lecture on Schiller's The Robbers, after which the public's interest in German literature supposedly rapidly shifted from complete apathy to intense engagement. Within a decade of Mackenzie's lecture, you remember German drama became so wildly successful that Wordsworth in the preface to Lyrical Ballads complained about the ubiquity of, quote, sickly and stupid German tragedies. And while the rich literature on the special relation between English and German thought post-1790, involving, say, Herder, Hegel, Sch Hegel, um, sorry, Herder, Schlegel, Hegel, Schelling, has been seminal for our understanding of Romanticism, in very different iterations, little attention has been paid to the decades immediately prior to the supposed turning point. And why would we want to change that, since this version of a 1790s rupture allows German idealism to map handsomely onto the British context at the exact time when it will become deeply relevant to poets such as Coleridge or later Shelley. 18th century British literature can remain safely monolingual, Augustine maybe even, and Romanticism joyously embraces the dizzying writings of German philosophy. Now the problem is that this story is historically inaccurate and hermeneutically very restrictive. Parcher Stephen, plenty of Englishmen read German literature in the 18th century and there is plenty of literature to read. So many and so much in fact that they turn out to be an integral part of British literary history. There is a wildly rich Anglo-German context in pre-1790s uh, pre London, which has been almost entirely forgotten, yet is tremendously important. And recovering this context has a straightforward literary historical dimension, obviously, but also opens up different kinds of theoretical avenues, as I'll hope to suggest. So I'll start with a very brief historical sketch, just to give you a sense of what I mean by Anglo-German context, these new things that exist in 18th century Britain. Around the time of Mackenzie's lecture, there's 6,000 plus Germans living in London. The number would reach 30,000 by 1799. That's actually a really large number if one thinks about it. Many of these were economic migrants of which plenty settled and stayed in London and elsewhere. For instance, 
between 1709 and 170 uh, 1708 and 1709, between 13,000 and 15,000 Germans arrived in London in a matter of weeks. As part of the public discussion of what to do with these Germans that had arrived in London, uh, Daniel Defoe actually published an essay entitled A Brief History of the Poor Palatin Re Refugees Lately Arrived in England, a passionate defense in favor of the Germans' right to stay based on his beliefs in free labor movement and his trust in the economic prosperity that it will produce. You can see interesting parallels with today's um, discussions. This event is just one example, of course, <coughs> of which there are many. Whether it be due to economic migration or for other reasons, there is, by the mid-1700s, a substantial German population that presents an important part of public life across classes and cultural spheres. Once I started digging, I discovered that there were important Anglo-German churches, Anglo-German literary presses, plenty of bilingual publications and language tutors, both for English and German. There were coffee houses <coughs> known for their Anglo-German newspapers and relevant political discourse. Some of the most important figures in the newly founded Royal Society were newly settled Germans. And I mean, so you get the idea, I think. Uh, but the Anglo-German context is uh, crucially not just about um, the influx of Germans to London alone. The other key thing for me is that the British themselves by no means perceive Germany to be a cultural wasteland, a view constructed by you know, our Victorian modern literary historians like Stephen. As I already mentioned, the British public in the 18th century did read rather a lot of German texts, albeit mostly in translation. They especially engaged with literature, politics, science, and theology. The popularity of Salomon Gessner's The Death of Abel is probably the best known example. It's partly still known because Byron and Coleridge um, mention it. They actually joke about it. Uh, it's first published in Britain, uh, sorry, uh, it, by, the, by, by 1766 in Britain, it is in its 13th edition and widely acknowledged by the British press to be as popular as Bunyan's Progress and Defoe's Robinson Crusoe. Crusoe himself is also an Anglo-German, by the way, but we can leave that later for the Q&A. There are plenty of other examples, including works by Klopstock, Wieland, Bortmar, Rambach, again, you get the idea. Most of these sources have been either forgotten or sidelined in literary scholarship. We can blame romantic or Victorian constructions for this, of course, but it's no coincidence, I think, that our mostly monolingual scholarship in the 21st century has been all too unwilling to go into these polyglot archives and unearth material that is foreign to us. In either case, it seems to me that if we want to generate a serious historical account of the 18th and early 19th century, these Anglo-German contexts can play a crucial role. It will require us to read the period anew and shift our scholarly attention from a monolingual Anglophone center to a more comparative multilingual context. One way to do this is to pay attention to religious congregations such as the Moravians, who had come from Germany to London in 1728 and quickly established themselves as one of the most important nonconformist congregations, populated by Germans and Britons alike. The Moravians would have, would have a good claim to count as the first worldwide Protestant church. Especially after its rise under the Saxonian Count von Zinzendorf, they were at the very forefront of 18th century globalization, sending missionaries to all corners of the planet, including the Americas, Greenland, the West Indies, Australia, and Tibet. Their British HQ was in London, where they were housed at Fetter Lane, um, and played an important role in recruiting and housing both German visitors, but also new British members of the congregation. One such member, was Catherine Blake, William Blake's mother. Recent work by Kerry Davis and Marsha Keith Sukert has shown conclusively that Blake's mother played an active role in the Moravian church, and there's a back history to this that I won't go into, um, but it's certain now. Um, she even applied to be a member of the so-called Congregation of the Lamb, an elite group within the Moravians. As Davis concludes, Catherine and her husband urgently wanted to join this inner circle where they could participate more intensely in the mystical marriage, of self <coughs> in the mystical marriage and salvific blood. I'll get to the strange theology in a bit. To become a member, both Catherine and her husband had to write letters of application that described why they were worthy of membership. 
and detailed their own experiential relation to Christ in Moravian terms. Here's Catherine's letter dating from around November 1750 that recently surfaced in the Moravian archive in London. I have very little to say of, my, of myself, for I am a poor creature and full of wants, but my dear Saviour will satisfy them all. I should be glad if I could always lay at the cross full as I do now. Thanks be to him last Friday at the love feast, our Saviour was pleased to make me suck his wounds and hug the cross more than ever, and I trust will, be, will more and more, till my frail nature can hold no more. At your request I have writ, but I am not worthy of the blessing it is desired, for I do not love our dear Saviour half enough. But if it, if it <coughs> is his will to bring me a lot among his happy, happy flock in closer connection, I shall be very thankful. I would tell you more of myself, but it is nothing that's good. So now I will write of my Saviour that is all love. Catherine's statement shows a deep familiarity with Moravian iconography and imagery. The focus on Christ's wounds, invoked so starkly by Catherine, was a favorite Moravian topic often associated with a sexual dimension. The mixture of spirituality and sensuality, the sucking of the wound, the hugging of the cross, is particularly powerful and suggestive. And this was not the first time Catherine had engaged with these ideas. She writes the letter and feels she's ready to be accepted into the congregation of the Lamb because last Friday she felt the power of our Saviour more than ever. So before she reaches a state of implausible, um, sorry, impossible intensity, till my frail nature can hold no more, she applies to be a Lamb in the flock in closer connection, that is, the congregation. Blake's future mother was clearly deeply marked through her involvement with this church, something that would have affected her way of relating to the world, including her children. As 21st century critics, we often forget that for people such as Catherine Blake, her son, and many other contemporaries, whether or not one believes in the reincarnation of Christ or the sacred nature of the Bible makes a big difference for how one thinks of one's own existence, ontology, and as a result, the kind of poetry that one is able, will, or can write. After all, the assumptions surrounding these questions reach into the deepest layers of existential self-understanding. Remember here that it was, it was Catherine Blake who intervened and saved her son from a thrashing when he had claimed to have seen a tree full of angels. Yet it also quickly becomes apparent how difficult it is to fathom the complexity of this conceptual and spiritual landscape, including angels and this kind of thing. And this lies both in the sheer magnitude of the task and in our own historical situation. As Francis Ferguson recently put it, one irony of our contemporary claim to be secular is that we have lost the ability to discern the difference between high churchmen and dissenters and don't recognize the distance between an Anglican God and priestlies, or Jefferson's minimalist theism in which Jesus and Socrates are put in direct comparison and competition with one another." Unquote. What's at stake in counteracting the inability that Ferguson diagnoses is not only a scholarly matter of correctly de describing the denominational preferences of particular authors, it's also to gain a sense that decisions of religious and theological preferences were complex, existential, and had far-reaching implications for the figures that we study. One way to do this is to consider what we might call the language and rhetoric or tropology of the Moravians. To pick the most evident example, Catherine refers to the happy flock of the congregation invoking the Moravian celebration of the Lamb. The Lamb was central to Moravian self-representation and they placed far more significance on it than any other Christian sect. The Moravian motto still remains, our lamb has conquered, let us follow him. And you'll recall that the elite group was titled Congregation of the Lamb. Thus, it's not an accident Catherine speaks of the happy flock. This kind of imagery is abundant in the application letters. Here is John Kennex from, an, uh, from around the same time. When that dear lamb please, I know he will bring me and give me into my mother's lap and say to her, take care of him. I feel I want to be nursed. I want to be in a little child's place and to be carried anywhere where my father and my mother please. 
Kenick takes the familiar elision of the lamb, Christ, and the child to an extreme. Just like in Catherine's letter, the desire to be nursed is important. The more familiar version here echoes an interest in physical care already seen in Catherine's phrase of sucking Christ's wounds, a distinctly Moravian way of nursing. In Kenick, the lamb delivers the child and speaks the word, the logos, that allows the child to be carried anywhere, including paradise. The Moravian investment in the symbolism of the lamb is going to be relevant for anybody interested in the links to Blake, since of course the lamb is one of Blake's central images too, much more important than others that he adopts from Christian iconography, say as, you know, for example, the cross. For him, just as for the Moravians, it's a structuring image that concentrates the celebration of the mysterious nature of creation. One recurring example from Blake that readers will easily recall includes the wandering questions about the mystery of creation and its seeming contradictions. In The Lamb, he asks directly, little lamb, who made thee? And in The Nearby Tiger, he famously wonders, did he who made the lamb make thee? We can add to these familiar examples another invocation of the Lamb as a powerful symbolic presence in Jerusalem that contains intriguing echoes of Catherine's application letter mentioned before. Oh, that the Lamb of God would look upon me and pity me in my fury. The way that the speaker here wishes the Lamb of God to give mercy recalls Catherine's wish, wish to bring me among his happy flock in closer connection. The animal here becomes the conduit through which God can look upon his flock and through which we can feel his presence. These examples of meaningful relations among the distant, distinct treatments of the central figure of the lamb point towards a set of more specific and tighter connections between Moravian and Blakean aesthetics. Once we pay attention to the Moravians and Blake's fascination with innocent childhood, pastoral care and the Christian imagery of the lamb, poems that we know very well such as the lamb, the shepherd, or a little boy lost, appear in a new light. The pastoral care that somebody, we, the readers, seek and receive, lies at the heart of all of these poems. They cover the concerns of what Blake in The Shepherd calls the shepherd's sweet lot, whose tongue shall be filled with praise. The shepherd hears the lamb's innocent call, and one of the reasons why the Christian lamb can rest in peace is that they know when, the, when their shepherd is nigh. Of course, the lambs over which the shepherd is looking are multiple in their meaning since they stand for themselves as well as for Christ, himself in turn the ultimate shepherd. Remember that Blake makes explicit in the lamb that he is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. Among the multiple elisions in these last lines lies one that blurs two versions of the not exactly human, Christ and the animal. Blake plays on God's power of naming. Just as Adam names the animals, Christ calls himself a lamb and thereby is called by us, by the name of the lamb, by thy name. Called by thy name also means, however, that we can resurrect Christ through the name. We can call upon him to appear as our shepherd and savior. In the end, he became a little child completing the circle and allowing the reader to turn back to the animal to exclaim, I a child and thou a lamb. To be united with Christ, John Kenick wanted to be in a little child's place. For him the child, just as in Blake, is the figure that becomes the shepherd and delivers us as innocent lambs. The songs of innocence and of, and of experience are Blake's poetic descriptions of the different versions of what Kenick called a little child's place of innocence, both biographical and geographical. His poems are about the possibility of finding this place and losing it, of inhabiting this place and mourning it. According to Blake, our innocence is either marred by experience or it is retained, however illusory or temporarily, by our own internal force. The most obvious example in this context is probably The Little Boy Lost and its counterpart, The Little Boy Found. The poems invoke pastoral care, the desire to self-infantilize, the longing to be found and led, which all may be read in tandem with Kenick's fantasy, to be welcomed into the fold of the church. They share an ideal of pastoral care that we find across the Moravians together with the imagery of the child and its rescue through a divine figure. 
The image of in the poem makes this link even more explicit. The little boy lost in the lonely fen, led by the wandering light, began to cry, but God ever nigh appeared like his father in white. The omnipresence of the divine down to the most concrete form is one of the baselines for the little boy's experience and Blake's poem. God is ever nigh, spatially and temporally, that he is always near is rooted in the experience of feeling God, <coughs> God's proximity in situations of crisis. Upon the children's cry, God becomes close, spatially and emotionally, and visible for the boy and opens him to salvation and redemption. The boy's perception opens God up for the reader as well, as a guiding light, not only in this particular instance of the individual child, but also of the larger historical context, because surely the wandering light through which the boy got lost is analogous to the versions of supposedly enlightening attitudes leading the way around Blake. The poem offers the chance to think about a potential corrective to this situation based in concrete experience and available through the boy through God's apparition. It's crucial that the vision of this corrective is delivered by telling us about the apparition of the child. The child is open for such salvation since his innocent cry has the ability to conjure up the presence of God. Naturally, the boy here is himself a cipher for any erring human traditionally likened to a child in nature. And now consider that the 1754 hymn, hymn book of the Moravians is entitled A Collection of Hymns of the Children of God in All Ages. So I think it's crucial that Blake uses the specific image of the child and insists on the importance of who is reading here. Just as the development of the lamb as a symbol has a long history, the child, of course, is also traditionally presented as the, intu as, as the intuitive and thus superior reader. The Moravian church actively participates in this aesthetic construction. And as Davis points out, Zinzendorf, um, um, bishop of the Moravian church, stressed that the unlearned or even small children can gain from singing these hymns despite their apparent obscurities. Like a new language to be learned, children adopt and mold the poetical forms in front of them, only to be in turn molded by them. And one learns without any prior knowledge or practice. This is what we call linguistic memory, which is akin to the muscle memory of a child that learns a sport. With repetition, thinking retreats, and the movement is not performed consciously anymore. Yet the child is still learning, though it does not really know what it is doing. For the Moravians, the singing of hymns was the most important way of gaining this knowledge. It would become the wandering light by which they lived. The figure of the lost child is deeply resonant for the Moravians and is repeatedly invoked in their mission to act as a pastoral, welcoming institution. In the context of London, this means to act as a charitable institution for Londoners, but also for the increasing number of international visitors that I mentioned before. One of these visitors was Johann Georg Hamann, and in this case, the image of a lost child really applies in many more ways than one. In 1757, Hamann has what he called the key experience of his life, during a trip to London in the very same year that Blake is born. Living a few blocks away from Blake's house, Catherine Blake could, or probably did, easily pass Harman on the streets of Soho. He actively se <coughs> seeks the connection with the Moravian congregation at that crucial moment in his life. One of the reasons why it's very generative to compare Harman and Blake is because they are, I'd argue, the most radical and shrill 18th century critics of instrumental reason. In a pointed remark, Harman comments that Kant's philosophy turns God into the ideal without knowing that his pure reason is precisely the same. In other words, the critique of pure reason is an exercise in apotheosis. Harman famously put, puts figural language at the very center of epistemology, ethics, and aesthetics. Poetry is the mother tongue of the human race. The so-called Margus of the North was recognized in his lifetime as a major figure. Goethe called him <coughs> the brightest head of his time, and Hegel devoted one of his longer, longest published pieces to Harman's works. Amazingly, 
These, despite their deep affinities, Blake and Harman have never before been read in tandem. And while I'm more focused on the historical angle here today, and let me just quickly gesture towards why I think this promises to be such a fruitful pairing also with theoretical dimensions. For Harman, the main power of language is not to be the functional handmaiden of reason, but rather its creative generation. When Harman speaks of the language as the uterus of thought, he argues for a view in which speaking is translation from a tongue of angels into a human tongue, that is, thought in words, things in names, images in signs. Crucially, there is an anthropomorphic and physical aspect to this translation. Just as thought and language are connected, so are lang language and the body. That body is also, just like for Blake and the Moravians, the sexual body that defines the human and can be celebrated as such. My rude imagination was never able to picture a creative spirit without genitalia. Now, if there is one person I can think of in Britain around that time that would say something like that, it would be Blake. The visionary and the spiritual are central, and they are tied to the human through perception and art. Both Harman and Blake have become what might be best termed canonical outsiders. They're admired for their creativity, but criticized for their style. They're deep, but incomprehensible, creative, but mad. The degree to which Harman and Blake violate the rules of writing philosophy or poetry are too radical, too experimental to be absorbed into canonical literary history. And they share this, of course, with the Moravians, who are also marginalized by the normalizing forces that Blake and Harman railed against. There would be plenty more to say about this, yet for now I want to return to Harman's London experience that led him on the way to believe all of the things I just mentioned. He had come on a business mission which failed, and this triggered a major tailspin into what we would now probably call um, a depressive episode and severe substance abuse. Yet for Harman, this road of excess ultimately leads to his palace of wisdom. He performs a crucial turn from the lifestyle of sins and vices to the deep study of language, God, and the Bible. And while it's unlikely we'll ever find out exactly what happened, there are obviously lots of theories about this, it's certain that it changed Harman's life and his attitudes, attitudes towards a version of the Enlightenment from promising proponent, as he was back then, to severe critic. One of the most central and innovative aspects of Harman's thinking, which connects well with Blake's work, is his fierce criticism of the ideological tendency to divide deep spirituality and mundane context. Thinking is never neutral, but always happens in a physical context. In revising the London episode, many Harman scholars have focused on his London reading, inner life, or on the consequences for his stay, for the internal structure of his work as a whole, i.e. the conceptual side. There's a risk here, though, to create the myth of Harman as an isolated figure whose moment of fundamental change is untouched by a concrete physical context. Yet Harman, as he would remind us, breathed London air during this time of change. He sought out company, and his spiritual turn took place as lived experience in a particular daily context. And this daily context includes the Moravian services, Soho and Broad Street, the neighborhood in which Catherine weaned little William and sang the sim hymns she had learned in the Moravian church at Fetter Lane. That church would also become important to Harman in adjusting for the sudden change from exhausting debauchery to spiritual study. Various scholars confirm that Harman had contact with the Moravian congregation and he had read some of Zinzendorf's writings uh, before coming to London. Thus, so there's no question about that sort of um, connection there. The specific context to, uh, um, in which Harman's spiritual turn happened is the same context in which Catherine Blake and Kenick were singing, writing, and preaching. Now, I want to draw your attention to one crucial dimension of this context which is relevant to all of these figures, albeit in very different ways. Namely, what I was started off with, the deeply Anglo-German character of Moravian practice. For Harman, as a German in London and lifelong Anglophile, the importance is obvious. And 
Uh, Hamann's an interesting figure here. I mean, he translates the Hume that Kant reads. He translates Berkeley, Johnson, you know, Shaftesbury. He uh, is an extremely important figure in that kind of uh, transmission. For Blake, it comes in a slightly more indirect yet crucial form, namely the Moravian hymns, which are part of the daily congregational life. This had historical precedent. Zinzendorf always insisted on preserving the distinctly German origins of his Moravian revival, even when in England. A startling example is that when he uh, lived and preached in London, actually his sermons were immediately translated into English during Mass by the London preacher. It makes sense then that Frankfurt Peter Böhler, Frankfurt born Peter Böhler, a bishop of the Moravian Church in England and in America, gave the following advice to his congregation in 1743. There should be always somebody among us to learn German. <laughs> Brother Gottschalk will give the brethren every day an hour at seven in the morning after the, after the Bible hour. And that in general an encouragement was given to the brethren and sisters to learn German. The demand for German lessons with the express idea that translation and continuous interpretation should be available represents a significant institutionalization of this kind of Anglo-German link. So given I knew about these connections slightly, I had a general sense that the Anglo-German link might be relevant, maybe even to Blake when I went to the Moravian archives last year. After my research there, I think I can make the case that it's certainly relevant but more importantly, it forms part of a larger set of connections that can make us understand the period in a fresh and powerful way. I should say here that the Moravian archives are actually fantastic. So if you get a chance to go there, it is a very weird and wonderful place. Um, so if you find yourself uh, in North London, you know, um, it's, a, it's a good place to go. Um, if you want to get a sense of the globalization, the ongoing globalization of the period is, of, is absolutely fascinating. Um, so I can only really give you a glimpse here, obviously, but I'll try and give you a sense why it matters, I think, um, that there is a particular kind of Anglo-German spin to this here. Following Moravian custom, the community at Fetter Lane kept a congregation diary. This basically allows us to reconstruct many of the daily practices of the congregation. Around 1757, the year of Blake's birth, of course, and um, Hamann's visit, the diary records liturgical practices, common readings, as well as national or international visits to the congregation. German is part of all of these activities. <coughs> At Fetter Lane, Brother Gumbrecht, uh, Grumbold, Grum, not clear, preached in the morning. Then Brother Broderson in German. He preached in English in the afternoon. Within one morning, maybe even within one service, we are presented with readings and preachings in, in, in German and English. This is nothing unusual, as the entry from only a week earlier shows. Then Brother Marshall, coming from Lindsay House, kept the choir probably singing, and after it, the German preaching in a very sweet manner. There is not just one among, the, among them who spoke German, but a variety of brethren that were proficient. Sermons, preaching, and singing all took place in English and German. Going through the congregation diary, we can see a pattern evolving, actually. English preaching in the morning uh, alternated with sermons and, or singing in German during the afternoons and in the evenings. A good number of other conference minutes are bilingual, presenting us with a mixture of English and German, not just on the same page, but sometimes within one sentence. So you get Babel within one sentence, really. Many bilingual documents draw visually attention to their linguistically mixed quality when they present themselves almost glass-like with both languages on opposing sides of a book, for example, like this. So you have clearly here, you have um, the, the English on the left and the German on the right. Thus, what, I, what we encounter in the internal memoranda of the church, we also find in the external written word. For a while, the Moravians actually had their own printing press, which was producing texts in German and English. Some of these were teaching materials or liturgical literature, uh, but most of them were actually hymn books. And there is a reason why I'm zooming on the hymn books here. 
singing was crucial to Moravian devotion, and the hymn was by far the most important genre in their practice. In literary study of the 18th century, we as British literature people m most often think of this genre in relation to John's and Charles Wesley and to Methodism, right? Though, of course, the hymn becomes central then later to Anglicanism and subsequent British literature, so think, you know, Emily Dickinson, Ezra Pound, etc. Charles Wesley had this to say about the Moravians. If you want to hear pure psalmody, go to Fulnick and hear them sing, them being the Moravians. Wesley, it turns out, was not just a musical fan. He was himself part of the Moravian congregation for a number of years before splitting off to establish the Methodist Church. Before the separation, both Wesleys had learned German partly in order to translate many hundreds of Moravian hymns into English that by now are commonplace even in Anglican services. So a good example is the 1754 uh, collection of hymns of the children of God in all ages. A lot of these are translations, actually. And as Geoffrey and Margaret Steed confirm, the 1754 hymnal drawing on German and other Central European sources to an extent unique in contemporary British hymnody was the foundation on which all subsequent provincial hymnals were built. So this is not just a one-off. The typical English hymn, then, is actually an Anglo-German hybrid. To put in, it in terms of the larger literary history, the origins of the form so important to Blake, Dickinson, or Pound lie in the nonconformist Anglo-German religious practices. Consider that these hymnals were the basis of years of congregational service, thus seeping deep into the musical, poetical, and linguistic habits of the congregation. Wesley's translations were made for people like Blake mother, or Blake's mother, who had no German, but still wanted to participate fully in congregational life. We could obviously suggest that such translation practices allowed the polyglot background to these hymns to disappear, and over time that's actually, of course, what happened, right? That's why we don't know this anymore, because the translations were so successful. But at the time when they were being were made and published, it was clear to the congregation that you know, there was something um, of, a, of a dual language um, uh, context um, in, which they were, in which they were being produced and sung. It would have been unmissable, I think. Given the interest in children and the religious instruction through singing, it doesn't come as a surprise then that the Moravians have their own school um, in which the, the hymns again take center stage. Um, they had all sorts of different choirs, male choirs, female choirs, and children's choirs. So here is another example that joins together from the archive, that joins together the different strands of interest I've been developing. It's a pocket book, it's quite small, of, uh, for the children's choir. A hymn book for the children belonging to the Brethren's Congregation, taken chiefly out of the German. The hymn book presents the children with both the German and the English versions. So, and here's an example. Yes, Lamb, thy heavenly turn of mind, thy youth pure and abstentious, thy blood of the true virgin kind into all virtue, virtue frame us. And the book concludes with a section which gives, gives Luther's paraphrase of the Creed and Ten Commandments, by which a child may accustom himself a little to read the language. Right? You get the uh, English on top again and the German on the bottom. This pocketbook and its suggested exercises are not just about language instruction. It's also about teaching a certain aesthetic and spirituality that are connected to the, multipl uh, to the multiplicity of languages. And that quite a bit hangs on this, actually. So the Moravians, just as Haman, uh, are part of a group of thinkers that um, think of Babel as a positive um, uh, symbol. Uh, of the multiplicity of languages through which God speaks to us, rather than the moment of uh, the fragmentation of languages that is supposedly negative and um, makes communication impossible. Um, so there's a lot that hangs on this. Um, volumes like this pocketbook point towards sources that bring together questions of children, song, and language, all topics that are crucial to Harman and Blake, and in a Moravian context. I'm going to conclude by trying to listen a little closer to the German echoes in one of Blake's early lyrics <coughs> that make us understand his, uh, as his work anew. And here is one of the Moravian hymns out of the collection of hymns. Morning star, I follow thee. Lead me here or lead me there. Though my staff in traveling be, I'll no other weapon bear. 
<clears throat> Me, my angels, God from ill, when I am to do thy will, so shall I with steady pace reach the dearest city, grace. The seeming simplicity of form and diction is remarkably close to Blake's shorter lyrics. The strange mixture of the abstract and the concrete in both the imagery and the ideas that this poem expresses echoes similar moves in the fly or infant joy. Ontology is located in the other, the, be, and there is something prophetic yet searching about this poem. The singer follows the star, whose direction almost seems random, or at least not clear to the speaker. He apostrophizes, lead me here or lead me there, thereby disclosing that he's not even interested in the accumulation of experiences because that would be lead me here and there, but gives himself in total faith here or there. It doesn't matter. The shepherd here does not need to use his staff as a weapon since the presence of angels will guard him from ill. I cannot but think that these angels meaningfully relate to the angels Blake sees in his childhood visions or in the angel in the songs, guarded by an angel mild, witless woe, was now beguiled. The dearest city is clearly an invocation both of Jerusalem, hence grace, and Augustine's textual and utopian city of God. In our context, the dearest city is also cosmopolitan London, home to the Moravians at Fetter Lane. It is the city in which Harman finds his God, his own Augustinian moment, an event that will deeply shape Anglo-German relations and turn the Enlightenment into a much more complicated category than we often want to admit. And the dearest city is also a place where angels guard from ill a Blake who's wandering and writing its chartered street, streets well into Romanticism. The multiple and complex connections between Blake, Haman, and the Moravians were not initially visible both for historical and for theoretical reasons. And there is, a, there is the historical aspect which reveals that 1750s London was a multilingual space with a tremendously active Anglo-German um, culture which the British actively read and reviewed. At the heart of that are the Moravians that are relevant both for Blake and Harman, two figures whose connections have never been explored. A multilingual and polyglot approach can suddenly perceive these constellations and use them to understand the period anew. Picture, for instance, a Harmanian enlightenment in which Blake would be, be <coughs> no longer the oddball of romanticism, but rather at its center. What has become clear, I hope, is that in 1750s London, the Moravians, Harman and Blake inhabit a multilingual sphere and context that we need to reinsert into our literary history and its theoretical explorations. It's essential we listen to these polyglot and complex exchanges so that we can trace the geographic, linguistic, and conceptual specificity, not just of this lo local historical context, but also of the period at large. Thank you. <laughs>